Hello and welcome to the hamlet of Alstonville in the Northern Rivers District of New South Wales. And welcome again to Australia Talks. Perched on a ridge above the Pacific coast, Alstonville is definitely no provincial metropolis, but a very lively community it certainly is. This whole area used to be covered with rainforest. These days though, other than imported camphor laurels, large tracts of this rolling hinterland are close to treeless. It's dotted with traditional farms like dairies and cheeky new tax-driven operations, macadamia and avocado orchards, tea tree plantations and the like. The views from the escarpment down to the coast are simply stunning. Between them, nearby Byron Bay and Ballina have attracted an eclectic bunch of residents and holiday makers. Straight and alternate travellers, sun seekers, retirees, five star types, backpackers, the lot. Lismore, also just down the road and quite close to Nimbin, the one-time hippie capital of Australia, is a country town with a university campus and all that goes with that. It's a pretty special spot to visit and if you ask the locals, a terrific place to live. I know what they mean. My place is only three hours drive back down the highway south of here. Welcome to Australia Talks, this week live from the Alstonville Entertainment and Leisure Centre. And speaking of things eclectic, as we were just a moment ago, that's actually not a bad way to describe tonight's panel. In response to a request for a greater role for young people in Australia Talks, 17-year-old local Elisa Belling, a student at the high school here in Alstonville and chair of the Ballina Shires Youth Council. A bloke who claims, a bit dubiously, to have got me my first job in journalism, <laughs> former national political correspondent, now freelancing, resident in this area for 13 years and local identity Mungo McCallum, the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Tony Abbott, who needs no introduction. Equally, no introduction, the former leader of the Australian Democrats, wooed onto their front bench a few years back by the ALP, Cheryl Curno. And in a week where the collapse of ANSET is being felt around the nation, local airline contractor and businessman Bruce Beasley. Please welcome our panel. Well, uh, what's it going to be tonight? Answer hitting the tarmac, the threat of war in the aftermath of the terror attack in the US, or the ongoing asylum seeker problem here in Australia? Let's find out. And remember, our panel have no idea of what the questions are going to be. Our first question tonight is from Patrick Houlihan. Patrick, who's a retired agricultural consultant, I believe. Patrick. Seeing we have the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, along with our Labor Shadow Minister in attendance, it would seem appropriate we should have the views on the behaviour of the unions in the ANSET debacle, especially the forced resignation of PricewaterhouseCoopers as administrators, as administrators and the failures since to get any ANSET aircraft back in the air. Why am I not surprised? The first question's about the ANSET debacle. Um, Cheryl Curnow, I think, rather than Tony Abbott, because I've got a fair idea of what he's going to say, but I don't know what you're going to say. What do you feel about the way the unions have handled this situation? Well, I don't think we should just point at the unions. I do think that it was um, unfortunate that they bailed up Helen Clark. I do think that that was unnecessary. But uh, as the American ambassador pointed out, um, when he, when he was wanting to get through, he was, he was not only let through but cheered by unionists. And on the matter of the administrator and the changing of the administrator, I think it's really important that people feel that their entitlements and, and all the creditors are being treated fairly. And it really did seem that there were two people in the same firm, maybe working at a greater distance from each other, but one was representing Air New Zealand and one was representing ANSET. And if you don't have confidence in the administrator, then I don't think the system's going to work. But do you think, and do you most think, people have acknowledged that, but that, that was a problem. Should, do you think the unions achieved anything for their members by holding up the process? Well, what's, call, what's stopping our ANSET from getting planes back up in the air? A lack of money at this stage and problems with insurance and leasing, not the unions. Tony Abbott, you're an old union lover from way back. What do you think? <laughs> oh, I'm, a, I'm an old union member from, uh, in, from indeed, way of the, back of too, the Australian of the, Journalist the Association, I believe. 
Look, uh, I think that uh, the anger that workers have towards ANSET Air New Zealand management is very understandable because uh, that management appears to have been on long service leave uh, for quite some time. Uh, the thing is not to do anything now which makes a bad situation even worse. And I think the risk is that some of the things that people are inclined to do in their anger are quite counterproductive. Uh, for instance, there is supposed to be a three hour national airline stoppage tomorrow. And I think that is the last thing Australia needs at the moment. On what, on what basis? Uh, well, I believe that the uh, ACTU has decreed that it will happen because uh, they just think it sends a signal. But what signal and to whom, I don't know. Uh, certainly I think the signal that we should be sending to the world is that we are trying to get planes back in the skies, we are trying to shift travellers and we're trying to protect worker entitlements. There's a lot, of talk, all about, those things are there's a lot of talk about planes being back up in the skies but not a lot of planes getting up there. Well, well uh, again, one of the things which uh, uh, allegedly has happened is that uh, um, union pressure has allegedly stopped uh, uh, Qantas from leasing some of the ANSET planes because the ACTU didn't want uh, the workers to operate under Qantas conditions. Now, I hope that's not true, but it was on the front page of the Fin uh, today, so because I'll as say I said, it, nevertheless. because because <laughs> as as I said, as I said, the thing is, the thing is not to interfere uh, with jobs at this time. And if people can get new jobs working for Ansett, well, that's great. Uh, for for Qantas, that's great. Bruce, as I, you should explain your involvement in the airline industry before you you respond. Uh, yes, well, I did work for Ansett and or, and Qantas as well in in uh, in the past for. Uh, this is an even-handed treatment of the issue then, yeah, on our part. About uh, 20 years, and uh, uh, my current involvement, I have a ground handling company in Ballina. Uh, I used to handle ANSET, but uh, I currently handle Qantas in Ballina. Right. So what do you think of the whole situation? Was it predictable? Were you surprised when ANSET fell over? Uh, being very close to the industry, I uh, could see some signs. Uh, that, How long that, ago? Uh, up to two years. Two years? Mm -hmm. How long ago did the government find out, Tony Abbott? <laughs> well, it depends which minister you ask and when you ask. And, you know, <laughs> I think uh, Helen Clark made it clear uh, last weekend that no one knew anything like the full extent uh, of Air New Zealand ANSET's problems until very, very recently. But what, what were you seeing, Bruce? I'm sorry to interrupt you, Tony, but what were you seeing two years ago that was, was a warning sign to you? It was, it was more to do with the industry itself and uh, all of the, uh, the costs that were being thrust upon airlines and uh, you know that they were continually having to look at cost cutting measures and I think that the uh, the industry has been in a bit of uh, turmoil for a few years now and uh, you know it, it gone are the days when uh, we were protected under a two airline policy and I think deregulation uh, probably may have come too quickly. That, that, that was the beginning of the problem. I think part well, of the problem for, for ANSET was that uh, some years ago uh, uh, Australian and Qantas amalgamated and that meant that uh, ANSET's competitor had uh, an international feeder in a way that ANSET didn't have and it seems that from that time uh, ANSET has been uh, under a fair bit of pressure. But to go, to go from a profitable situation to a huge loss situation mm. in such a short time oh, is sure. amazing. I mean, Cheryl, you were going badly to... Well, I was just going to say that really the overseas experience shows you that when an airline's under cost pressure one of the first things they do is cut back on maintenance. That signal was there with ANSET quite a few months ago and I don't see that John Anderson did anything about it. If that had been me, based on what I've seen overseas, I would have been extremely worried. I but would not have said, oh, you know, it'll all work itself out. So Let's go to the audience. Gentleman in the, in the green check shirt, second back row. We can get a microphone to him. Yeah, but if the administration or the management of Air New Zealand have been on long service leave, why is it being left to a levy on <coughs> Australian travellers to pay the workers' entitlements. Why isn't that being sent home to Air New Zealand if, you know, the, the principle of mutual obligation is being applied to corporations well, as well as individuals? That, that, that's a good point. That's a good point. And, and the government believes, the government strongly believes that Air New Zealand have a heavy moral and legal responsibility to pay workers every last cent that they are owed. Uh, and if, as things work out, uh, the government ends up paying those entitlements, well, the government will then stand in the shoes of those workers in respect of their legal rights, and we will exercise 
those rights against Air New Zealand, to get the money off them. But why has the government only just discovered <laughs> this heavy moral and legal responsibility from employers who go bust through bad management? After HIH, I mean, Brad Mill I mean, and National Textiles. For years textiles. and years That's this right. has been happening. Under and the government and the too. government has been saying in the past, no, we won't run an employer's levy. No, if we're going to bail these people out at all, it'll be taxpayers generally paying the bill. Why has there never been in the past this feeling of responsibility from the government? Well, I mean, ask Cheryl, because she represents the Labor Party, which I'd did nothing just like in 13 years. the last six years, yeah, well, Tony. Well, well we, put, we put a scheme in place, we put a scheme in place uh, 18 months ago, and it was the first scheme ever. Uh, and uh, until we changed the scheme, it was the only scheme. But it still depends on taxpayers' money. It doesn't put the responsibility onto the employers, which is where it should be. Well, one of the other things because that we're doing... Because they're legal entitlements. <coughs> let's, let's go to the audience, Mungo, just mm. for a moment. Sure. Gentlemen here in the cap. Yeah, I think both, both Liberal and Labor governments have abrogated their responsibility to the Australian people, and they've left, left, left a bunch of cowboys running the country, and this is the effect of it. We're seeing all our public assets flogged off to Firstly, uh, companies in Australia who borrow money overseas and pump the debt up, and now uh, now we've got we're left to pay with it. And you lot there are just sitting back and, and uh, getting your money, and, and workers are getting sacked through your both your policies that have left this country bereft of are going to leave us all bankrupt. Let's have a let's have another let's have a very quickly. And Bob Hawke that bought on deregulation, not the Liberal Party. Let's go to another another question. Judy Burns, you have a question on the same subject but a different aspect. Judy Burns. Yes. My question to Tony and Cheryl is, who should ultimately be responsible and accountable for the mess that taxpayers do find themselves in when corporate bosses take their huge bonuses and leave goods and services floundering, as in HIH and ANSET and other companies that Cheryl has mentioned? Well, well the people who do the wrong thing, uh, the people who do the wrong thing should ultimately be accountable and uh, if people have uh, uh, looted their companies, uh, as it seems uh, some directors have, uh, they will be pursued by the regulatory authorities and they will be brought to justice. Cheryl? Well, di directors obviously, and not taxpayers. I mean, um, Kim Beasley just introduced a, a private member's bill on corporate responsibility and employee entitlements. But I think you have to change a culture which says it's not okay to use legitimate employee entitlements for cash flow or for emergencies or anything else. They should be protected, put aside and guaranteed. Clayton, Clayton Oates. Clayton's in the audience. Clayton, you have a question also on, on the question of answered and entitlements. Yeah, my question uh, is probably directed towards Tony Abbott. Um, the question from a small business perspective is why should the government bail out ANSET worker entitlements and not those of other companies which relied on ANSET for their business? For example, a catering company, and you could go on and on and on. Well, well in, in fact, we are picking up uh, the entitlements of the catering company because uh, we have this general entitlement scheme uh, as well as the ANSET scheme that we announced earlier this week. Uh, and the general entitlement scheme will provide workers with the same level of protection uh, except for a salary cap, uh, as, as, the, as the ANSET workers. Where, where, you start that routine, where do you finish? I well, mean, there is no end to it. Well, we, we have guaranteed uh, that all Australian workers who lose their statutory and community standard entitlements uh, because of the insolvency of their employer uh, will have those entitlements uh, guaranteed uh, by the government. Yeah, but so the community standard is not always the amount of time that the person's been working. I don't know, where did you get this community standard? Well, we got it from the Industrial Relations Commission, yeah, which determined that eight weeks was the community standard yeah, but for but for a whole lot payments. of ANS, ANSET workers who've been working for 20 and 30 years, it's not, a, it's really isn't particularly fair. I know it's a compromise, sure. but let's, it's not. Let's get, a, let's get another comment from an audience member or another question. Right, uh, right over here on the left-hand side, behind, uh, behind our stand there. Take a while to get to you. I think a lot of people would like to find out too, and this is a hypothetical question on my part, who is actually going to pay the money in the long run? If you get the money off Air New Zealand, will people get $10 off there?